Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us tonight. My name's John Rowe. Um, I'm presenting a little bit, and I'm also emceeing with me. I've got Mark Honeybone and Chris Peterson, both of which will, I think, bring some interesting insights for all of us uh, later on. How we intend to run tonight is that um, we've got a bunch of topics to carry through, to run through, um, in particular, I'm going to be discussing changes uh, to the LTC or look-through company rules, uh, some changes to the provisional tax um, rules, and also some FBT um, changes. There's the new resident land or residential land withholding tax that's applicable to offshore landholders. Uh, foreign trust disclosure rules that will certainly hit. Uh, some people, it's actually quite surprising how many people are affected by that. And also some changes um, regarding tax residency. And uh, you'll be pleased, probably most people will be pleased to know that Inland Revenue have been um, taking some losses or some hits in this area. Uh, so there's been some good results for the taxpayer. Um, Mark's going to cover off um, a bit of an update on the market and where we're at. Some advantages and disadvantages of new builds and some tips on uh, selling and, and transaction, transacting in this market, um, which is um, quite interesting. I think that fits nicely with Chris's um, presentation tonight uh, about loan facilities, and certainly we've all experienced the uh, difficulties, et cetera, um, dealing with banks and how they tend to be changing their rules on a weekly basis, if not more frequently. Uh, so it's always good to hear Chris's um, take on this and where things are going and what he's seeing and certainly it's been interesting talking to him on the lead up um, just before we kicked off tonight as to where the banks are at and certainly um, some banks have got the screws tightened and others are realising that it's costing them customers and are, are freeing up the money which is fantastic. Uh, so there's a whole issue of LBRs to deal with and um, first homeowners uh, who are those lucky individuals uh, that have got some um, some benefits that the rest of us can't have in regards to LBRs, etc. Um, the format of tonight, we're going to try, despite our um, all of us having the desire to talk forever, and uh, we all, both, all three of us, love hearing our voices. Uh, we'll try and keep to about 15 to 20 minutes each, and then allow about 10, 15 minutes for question time, and uh, we'll be then emailing the. Um, presentation tonight, we're recording it, so we'll send it out to everybody uh, later on, or probably tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much, and if you've got questions, um, feel free, send them through. On the webinar, you'll see on this right-hand side of your screen, there's the ability there to uh, type in questions, and certainly as they come up, uh, if there's anything pertinent, etc., we'll run through those towards the end and uh, select uh, a few and um, give the answers to those. Okay, so, Let's kick off um, the really exciting stuff um, that everyone wants to know. Tax changes, I know it's better than watching The Bachelor or anything else like that that's on tonight, and that's why you've all logged in um, to hear this. So, very quickly, uh, there's been a whole bunch of little tweaks to the LTC regime. Nothing truly dramatic, but um, you know, if you look at it, I think that it's all actually quite fair and uh, it is great for the, you know, the, the average taxpayer. Um, the big hooks, though, that you need to be careful about, probably the biggest, is LTCs that are owned by trusts. And um, it's very commonly used where you've got, for example, uh, somebody who's self-employed with a business um, in one LTC, a rental property company in another, and they're distributing uh, the profits and losses up to a trust. Well, there's been a change in the rules whereby if that trust makes a distribution to another company, then that will revoke the LTC status of the shareholding trust. Okay, so, uh, sorry, shareholding company. So if one of those LTCs that made the distribution up to the trust, if that trust then gives that income to a company, it will cause that the originating LTC to lose its status. So something you need to be very, very careful about that because, of course, 
if LTC status is lost, that can cause a deemed disposal and uh, quite a few tax consequences that are, that are nasty. The other thing is that um, the bit that I sort of went a bit ugh about was the change in the election rules. So effectively, um, prior to the change, the rule was that you looked at the unimputed reserves and if they were taxed at 28%, i.e. the company tax rate, that was all that needed to be done. That was um, There was no more tax payable. Now, obviously, there was a difference between the 28% tax rate applicable to a company and a trust's and individual's tax rate, at, you know, the highest being 33. And so you could shield, that it provided opportunity to shield the 5% difference between those two tax rates. You could elect into an LTC regime and shield that 5% difference, which for some clients added up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, that's now been stopped and that the tax now has to be paid as if it's up to the 33% rate. So it captures that 5%. That is, um, I think, quite a, uh, one of the more negative side of things that's come through. The also um, pleasing to note, and I'm sure all of our accounting staff in here will be pleased to note, that the loss limitation rules have been repealed except if you have a partnership of LTCs. Now that's relatively rare. The great news is, well, you know, while it was a pain in the neck to calculate, well, the whole purpose of that loss limitation rule was um, really to cap a person's ability to claim losses to how much they had contributed into the um, business, so their cash contribution effectively. Um, IRD announced that less than you know 0.1 percent of taxpayers were affected. So if you were one of those unfortunate people, the good news is about this um, repealing of the section that you can go back and retrospectively claim any losses that you weren't allowed. But be warned that it does still apply if you've got a partnership of LTCs. That's because the loss limitation rule applies to limited partnerships, which IRD consider to be you know, more complex, and they consider LTCs to be more mum and dad investment vehicles. So that whole area, they've kept it for the more complex scenarios. So if you've got an LTC that, for example, you may own a property uh, half with your LTC and half with a, you know, a sibling or a friend or something like that in partnership, these rules still apply to you. Um, so your accountant will still need to pull their hair out and suffer um, some of the calculations, which, to be frank, um, were a pain in the neck. And moving on, new provisional tax rules. Um, I think this is one of the uh, best things that come out of these changes. Historically, when you were a provisional taxpayer, so for those of you that aren't provisional taxpayers, what it is is provisional taxes where you've got um, more than two and a half thousand dollars worth of uh, they call it residual income tax or tax to pay at the end of the year. You become a, a provisional taxpayer. That means that you have to pay that untaxed portion uh, three times during the year. So you end of year tax, you pay three times during the year. And um, if you've got a March balance date in um, August, January, and uh, May following the end of the financial year. The really unfair thing about the previous rules is that you basically had to know what your income would be for the year right back at your first provisional tax payment where you're you know, just going through the 28th of August. So on the 28th of August, you had to make a projection, and if you got it wrong, you were penalised. Because if you got it wrong, IRD assumed that, well, you had to pay one-third of your tax by that date. If you didn't, you um, got charged interest. Um, conversely, if you paid too much, you got paid interest. But of course, um, there was a big difference between what you had to pay versus what you received. So. Use of money interest now only kicks in from the on underpayments, etc., and overpayments from that last provisional tax payment, which is in the effectively a month after balance date. It's on the um, it's in May, so you've got that time between you've actually completed your financial year. You're virtually a month after balance date, and you can then work out you've got a much more um, probably grasp on how you did for the year. So you can pay a top-up payment if needed, and that way um, you'll minimise your interest payments, etc. I think it's a much fairer system, and it was an area that I know over my years of practice that people used to really um, become frustrated about, particularly if you had a, 
um, unforeseen event or you didn't budget um, fully or you had you know, a sale that you didn't expect, you were then penalised for that, which was unfair. The other thing is that uh, the safe harbour, real technical thing, safe harbour position. So if you are a tax provisional taxpayer and um, you either estimated or you didn't pay enough, in order, you know, before you got considered for penalties, uh, the threshold is now increased from, you know, if you had between uh, 2500 and 50000 worth of end-of-year tax, uh, that was considered safe. If you got it within that target, you weren't subject to penalties. That's now increased to 60000 um, and it's also applicable to non-individuals. So previously it was just for you know, people. Now it's moved to people and um, companies, trusts, etc. Uh, far fairer situation to be in. Um, so you know, I think there's a lot more flexibility for uh, seasonal trading to be reflected in provisional tax payments and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, FBT. Uh, I'll call FBT, and well, I'll be cheeky and say that it's a little bit of a um, you've got to be careful. For most people can structure their business around FBT, um, but for those that can't, and certainly in some situations, it's actually in people's benefit um, to have be subject to fringe benefit tax. And I'm going to come to, believe it or not, I'm going to come to that in a minute. So um, there's always been a difference between how small companies, i.e. with five or less individual shareholders, so that's not companies that are held by trusts, so there's a bit of a debate going on at the moment within land revenue that it should be extended to companies that are owned by trusts. So this is small companies with five or less individual shareholders. You can now treat FBT on vehicles, or effectively vehicles, as if you were a sole trader. So what happened if you're a sole trader? You could go, well, my vehicle is 60% business, 40% individual, I'm only going to claim it for the 60% and do it that way. If you had a company previously and you had that situation, because the vehicle was available for private use on that 40% of the time, you had to pay FPT. Um, so it was a little bit unfair. The same you know, uh, applied if you had it 99% for business and 1% private use, you'd still have to pay FPT on it. So there were all sorts of things um, to minimise that, recipient use contributions, all sorts. So what's happened now is that you can treat it as if um, you were a sole trader, uh, but it applies to vehicles that are bought or first used. So this is a vehicle that is first used in a business after the 1st of April um, this year. So if you've got, unfortunately, if you've got a, business, a vehicle that's been in your business for a while, that cannot, um, you can't take advantage of these rules. It's only new vehicles or vehicles that you're introducing. So, for example, a private vehicle that you're using for business for the first time after 1 April. Um, it's also only for, if you've got two vehicles or less in the business and no other benefits are provided. So that's no other benefits to anybody. That includes employee benefits or anything like that. If you've got any other benefits, you can't take advantage of this rule. So it's, it's very narrow. Um, and also, you know, you can have situations where you don't, you want to pay FBT. So that could be a classic case of the um, relatively low value classic car that maybe your business vehicle, you use it every day in the business, etc. But it's got the high maintenance costs on it. So the, FB, the, the cost of being an FBT is... Um, more than outweighed by the benefit of being able to claim or the expenses, etc. You know, and of course, if it's your business car, then there's no issue with doing that. Um, resident, residential land withholding tax. If you recall, this is the big controversial area of foreign investors buying up New Zealand and trading properties and that sort of thing and not paying tax on it. So what's happened now is that it applies to all offshore people who are selling property that would normally be um, subject to what they call the bright line rule. So that's that two year rule. If you buy a property that you resell it within two years, you, you pay tax on it. Now there's an exemption normally that uh, for your own home, the bright line test doesn't apply. However, because this is a rule for offshore people, there is no home exemption because if you're offshore, you're not going to have a home. Um, that's my IRDs thinking, if I can understand the logic on that. So th there's now a tax that needs to be deducted. So if you're offshore, 
and you sell a property in New Zealand and you've held it for less than two years, tax has to be deducted out of it at the lesser of 10% of the gross value or the sale price less the cost of the property multiplied by your tax rate so you get no benefit for any other costs like um, you know, real estate agents or disposal costs or interest or anything like that because you're expected still to file a tax return where you can claim all of those expenses in there. Um, or, of course, the lesser of the sale price, less the secured debt. So, of course, you can't be expected to pay any tax on it if um, all the money is hoovered up by a secured borrower. Um, so, again, there's some obvious little opportunities in that swithing in here. Um, but again, it's one of those additional compliance loads and it is something that if you're an offshore investor that you need to be careful about. Okay. At foreign trusts and um, exposures around that, again, um, a big um, media expose about um, foreign trusts in New Zealand being uh, South Pacific Cayman Islands. Uh, hiding all the dictator's money, etc. Well, public pressure has kicked in and the government's changed the rules there. What a foreign trust is, is a trust where there are no New Zealand tax residents. I mean, no New Zealand tax residents have settled any money or put any cash or any other property into the trust. It's come all from overseas parties. So, Use, what used to happen was that there was virtually no disclosure. Well, there was a, a questionnaire that I think had about six um, questions on it. Uh, no real information. That's now changed dramatically. So now there's a, um, of course, there's a $270 fee. Uh, you have to file a copy of the deed. You have to provide details of all the parties, trustees, beneficiaries, settlers, etc. All of that information needs to be applied. Every year you must file an annual return. Um, on it, you have to provide financial statements, you have to provide details of all trusts and all distributions, etc. And the real hook here, IRD has the power to um, refer anything that it considers to be, shall we say, um, shady uh, to the Department um, of Internal Affairs, the police, or any tax treaty partners. So that's other countries that we have a tax treaty with. Um, so, you know, there's nothing being hidden, it's all being disclosed. Uh, it affects new trusts immediately um, and any existing foreign trusts, and it's actually quite surprising as to how many of these there are around, and any existing trusts need to have the, um, need to register from 30 June. So it's quite an onerous um, compliance task going on there. We're at the moment GRA reviewing all of our trustees to see if there's uh, any people who are overseas, um, any that may be applicable, and uh, trying to work through that. And it's actually uh, quite a big process to go through. Okay, um, tax residency. This has been one area of the last few years that IRD have been particularly aggressive um, in, and I think it's resulted in some really unfair. Uh, outcomes. Uh, one of them that was really unfair was the case of a security contractor who left New Zealand, um, had a estranged spouse, so separated, he had children here, um, and he was sending money back to his children um, and his um, ex-partner here. Uh, he had a rental property, but he had no home. He hadn't been in New Zealand for years, and IRD attacked him. Um, and said that he was tax resident because he had um, the children here and he had the rental property here. So they argued he had a permanent place of abode. Thankfully, IRD have lost that. Yeah. So that permanent place of abode now means that if you don't have a home in New Zealand, you basically can't be a resident. Uh, and that's, I think, quite fair because if you've got a, a rental property, of course, you know, and, and you've got no history of kicking the tenants out and moving in there every time you come back to New Zealand. How can you have a permanent place of abode here? And the fact that you may have children here or an ex-spouse, I think is a real 
um, uh, it, it's just interpreting the law too tightly. And um, thankfully, the um, IRD who won in the Taxation Review Office, that was then um, the taxpayer appealed that to the High Court that found in his favour. IRD um, tossed their toys and appealed it to the Court of Appeal, and they lost there as well. So they have now tightened up their um, interpretation policy. And basically now, if you don't have a home in New Zealand, you can't be a tax resident if you fulfill all the other criteria as well. Uh, so I, I think that's a very, very fair outcome. Okay. Um, now, moving forward in particular, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that, are whole, that have a, um, a bunch of specific questions and that's thing. We're going to move on to some, um, we'll cover some more of the big picture things towards the end of the seminar. But just want to make the point that if you're a GRA client and you've got any questions, please get in touch with your client service manager. They you put a call. We don't charge for phone calls or anything like that. So pick up the phone, talk to your client services manager, and they'll answer any of your questions. If you're not a client of GRA, go to our website, gra.co.nz, request a free meeting. We'd love to sit down and go through with you and see where you're at and um, help you out. And if you want to get some more um, education, you're looking at getting into property, uh, or you want to learn more about it, have a look at one of our uh, property investment um, and education evenings, our PIE evenings, you can book those on our website. Uh, we've also got a large economic update coming up with Matthew Gilligan and Tony Alexander, uh, and that's proved very, very popular last year. There were about 900 people attending that. So if you're interested in any of those things, do have a look on our website. I'm going to hand over now to Mark Honeybone um, from Property Ventures. And uh, he'll come. He'll cover through those topics that we talked about earlier. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, John. Let's get myself in the uh, hot seat here, and uh, and thank you all for logging on to get inspired by John and Chris and I, and having to listen to me. Um, so uh, got on the uh, what I'm talking about tonight, and. So what I'm going to do is just my take on the market in different areas of New Zealand, and I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just talking. I'm live and breathe property every day of the week. I talk to the some of the best experts around the country, and um, and as I said, I live and breathe and love dealing with this. So I'm just going to. I'm always free to talk about my experiences and stuff I see in the market. Um, I'll talk about advantages, not so much disadvantages, but what to be aware of with new builds. And I'll finally uh, talk about tips on selling the property. Uh, if you're selling it yourself or through another agent, whatever, um, a few important tips on where we are in the market at the moment. So to get started, uh, bef before I even discuss the property market, uh, we need to understand the property cycle. So bear with me for a few minutes. I, I could talk about this for hours, but uh, as John said, we do like our own voices. But I've got to do this in about the next five or ten minutes, so I'll endeavour to do that. What I'm talking about is just generically speaking. So. I look at these two property markets in New Zealand. There's the Auckland property market, or property cycle, uh, and, and then there's the outside of Auckland property cycle. And I'm a very big believer of this is how it's worked the last three cycles, and the cycle seem to be going exactly the same way. So the first one, the Auckland market, consistently sort of goes upwards uh, at, at different levels, obviously, during the cycle. Uh, and I'll explain that a wee bit more as we move on. Uh, Compare that with the rest of the uh, the rest of the country, and remember this is just very generically speaking. It will stay; the market will be flat for five or eight years. There won't be much growth. Uh, people in Wellington will really uh, appreciate this because that's how it, exactly how it was. They had eight or nine years of no growth at all, and then it will follow Auckland and then the other bigger cities and get some good growth. And they'll have some you know, very good growth for two or three years, depending on where they are. And uh, when it gets over that peak, unfortunately. They have some very large drops, and I've got 10 to 50 percent, which sounds a bit brave, but I know the last cycle, uh, some places in the far north, that, that uh, did lose up to 50 percent of what, what they were worth three years later. Now, last year, the um, far north, Wanganui, the Bay of Plenty region, and the central Otago had massive drops. And when I put 10 to 50 percent, you know, those areas did lose sort of 30 to 40 percent in a lot of those areas. So what I'm going to try to do to get some substance to uh, this is I'm going to show you a couple graphs and a Mount Roskill one is just, just an area I picked. I also had one I was going to show you with Manurewa, but it was pretty well the same graph apart from a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, less prices. So let's have a, a quick look at what I mean between the difference in the Auckland market and the rest of the country. 
Uh, if you go back here, I don't know if you can see that on your screen, you probably can, uh, 97, 98, and the 97 or the market crashed a little. And um, we'll see around the rest of the country it crashed a little bit more than here. Now this is Mount Roscoe, it dropped minimal, it probably dropped one or two percent back then. Um, it did take this did take a couple of years this time to actually grow back. I know Manurea went a wee bit further up. And then you got great growth, you know, good growth. Uh, you know, Auckland's affected by policy changes probably more than other parts of the country. And, and that's for the better. So as some policy changes happen, the Auckland market takes off. And you can see the graph going up there, up to 07, 08 with the GFC happen. And then it dropped, and you know, it only dropped, you know, probably about 5% by them looking at the graph there. And then, of course, it's gone up, and over the last couple of years, uh, due to LVR rules, etc., it's had more growth than probably than normal. Um, but the biggest graph, you'll, the thing to take out of this graph, as you'll see when I put the next one up, it's consistently going up. And no matter anywhere in that graph, if you held your property for two or three years, you've, you've done pretty well. Uh, this is to July last year. Obviously, that might have flattened off a little bit in the last six months since the LVR rules, the latest LVR rules, had come in. Okay, so that, that's Auckland, and as I said, it's ge generically all of Auckland I'm sort of talking about with that. Then if we go to um, an example I'm going to talk about is Marlborough. And if I show you the graph before I uh, talk too much about this here, the what you'll find, is, ignore that spike there. Sometimes figures um, and graphs lie to you. In smaller town New Zealand, you might see something like that and, get, and go, geez, what, what the heck happened there? Um, what probably happened there was there was 10 vineyards sold within a six month period for two or three million and it affects and spikes the um, the market there. So you can get that other picture, it's what you're looking, the rest of the graph of what's important. So if you go back there um, and you go to 07, 08, before then you had to, again, really incredible growth. Uh, I was at Marlborough at the time, I remember this period of six years, very seven years very well. But you'll see what happened at 07 when it peaked. Uh, the average price is about 333000 and then it dropped down in 2002 to 240000 about a 15% uh, drop. Uh, I, I um, own property down there at the time. Uh, I know my two bedroom flats went from 205000 to 150000 each. Uh, my family home went from about 500 k to 440 at the time. Um, but, but what you'll notice about the graph, you look at the July last, uh, July last year, Back nine years earlier, there's been no growth at all. It went down, it went up, and, and there hasn't been any growth. And that's quite familiar with the, uh, you know, many graphs I could put around the little town New Zealand of how it, how it looks. If I show you some other graphs of the far north, um, you would see this drop in 07 to sort of 11, 12, dropping off 30, 40 percent, uh, and, and then coming back up. And I'll mention an example of that soon. Yes, as of late, um, this continued this graph in the last six months, it has actually gone up further. Uh, but be wary of what I'm going to cover soon, what happens after that. So where are we um, in the cycle? I was talking to someone a couple of days ago and they said, Mark, we're about 10 to 12. And I said, well, you, you, you're probably about right. I've got 75 to 100% to make myself totally correct. Um, I know it's definitely somewhere in there where the cycle is. Uh, I had a look a couple of days ago in the Property Investor magazine uh, that came out in April and had the medium sale price. And I was really interested looking through that and I looked at the one year figures um, of growth in the last year, of the last 12 months. And there were about five places that had, has had more than 80% growth in the last one year. That's 80% more from what the, their places was worth a year earlier. And I looked through it and it was places like uh, Dargaville Borough. At 96%, more expensive than they were a year earlier. Uh, Kawakawa, Monganui, Russell at 85%. And listen to this, Russell went up 85% over the last 12 months. Amazingly enough, it's still 11% down on what, what prices were worth there 10 years ago. So it just shows that you've got to be very careful where you are in the property cycle of when you buy property. Uh, Medicare Rural was the other one of note, and actually it had was a, the biggest um, rise in the last uh, 12 months. So when I look at that and see small towns in New Zealand showing those figures, it gets me uh, very concerned that we're extremely close in 10 to, 10 to 12, maybe we're 5 to 12 in the cycle. So what does all that gibberish mean? Um, it's uh, interesting. So you know, I'm just going to talk firstly about the number of sales, not the price, but the number of sales. 
Auckland first home buyers have been hit pretty hard recently. Their share of the sales has gone from 22% last year to 19% this year. Uh, the number of sales is obviously lower and a reflection probably of the increased unaffordability as well as rising mortgage interest rates. And uh, as Chris will probably tell you shortly, uh, lending criteria has got extremely hard. I know many of us have felt that. Uh, the slowdown in number of sales isn't just in Auckland. Uh, the main centres have had fewer sales in the last three months uh, as of a year ago. Uh, Hamilton's down 21% of sales, uh, Tower Roma down 34%, and Wellington and Dunedin are down 15%. Might be surprised with the Wellington, prices are still going well there, but the sales have dropped down from the dizzy heights of last year. So as to the values, the values have dropped in Hamilton. Uh, it sort of peaked, I think, in July last year. I think the LBR rules really hurt Hamilton a bit. It's flattened out now and um, probably of, of where the market is for a, a short time. Uh, it's flattened out in Tarawa, and at the moment there's no sign of a drop of values in Wellington. Wellington's still uh, growing quite well at the moment. I still see Wellington as a good uh, point, you know, a place to invest at the moment. Lower prices and good cash flow still. Uh, so new listings and demand have already began to slow down a bit, um, be sort of into the autumn season before the winter, and normally that would happen before a surge in spring. Uh, we seem to have an election coming up in, in September, so we'll see how that, that pans out. So what do I think? Uh, in short, I don't think the Auckland market's going to rock along anytime soon, uh, but with elections being slightly earlier than normal, the summer might actually go a bit quicker than it might normally after an election year. Uh, been those couple months earlier. Um, there's an article coming up in next month's magazine, uh, Property Investor magazine that Amy Hamilton's doing, and she talks about proven uh, areas like Auckland uh, versus hotspots around the country. And we come up with a really good catch phrase that I can't actually remember right now, but basically what it meant was in those hotspots or those areas outside of Auckland uh, at the moment, buy under value. And we just saw that graph, it goes up there, great, great growth, and then right at the top it dips and can go anywhere from sort of 10 to 40 plus percent. So it's, you, know, you must buy under value now if you're buying in, in one of those smaller areas outside of Auckland. Uh, I saw many people get hurt last time around and they've come all right eight years later. But it's been a, a long eight years for a lot of those people. Uh, the other way around in Auckland or the proven areas, uh, we've got the you know, you pay market value but have a plan in place and and finance are sorted, so you, you'll have your fixed uh, loans for you know, five years or whatever it might be, even three years, or um, and you'll have your tenants in the, so buy a property at market value if you've got a good plan in place to get through any headaches that may come up. So Auckland is still a real mystery at the moment, there's plenty of reasons why the market should flatten out, the last three years have had incredible gains, uh, prices have gone up 95% since February 11, uh, finance is tough and auction rates have been low. So that's fine, yeah, it should flatten out, and, and, and probably that's what I have been thinking myself of late. But then, you know, this week you, you read the paper and um, we need 100,000 more homes in Auckland for 290,000 people in the next 10 years. But we haven't been keeping up with that for very long. Babies this week sold two-thirds of their um, auction properties at auction, and there's another auction with apartment sales where two-thirds were sold. Um, just on apartments, the apartment market is pretty strong right now, and that's probably a change also of the last 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago when the market dipped, we had a, an abundance of apartments were built. Um, some people probably paid a little bit too much for them. Uh, 10 years later, it's a way of living in New Zealand now. I'm, I'm selling apartments, so I've got three one-bedrooms I've just been selling them. And what I've learned, uh, there's a lot of home buyers buying one-bedroom apartments. Uh, a lot of people who have migrated from Asia in the last three years to Auckland and they're looking for their first home and they find it really tough to get a um, you know, get an apartment in the paper yesterday. There was an article in the Herald saying it's $500,000 the average price now for one bedroom apartment in Auckland. And I know that that's exactly right. So you know, where are we? Who knows? You know, overall, the long term in Auckland is still very strong and stable. We've got, got the shortage of housing that, we, that we've spoken about. Um, but you still don't want to pay too much for a property. There are some real um, uh, good, good deals uh, out there at the moment if you look around. Uh, will they keep going? Who knows? Uh, outside of Auckland, as I said, I still see one as a, a, a good option uh, for the reasons I mentioned before. 
I personally think others might disagree, but the long term of growth and, and uh, for an affordable price, I see Christchurch as a solid long term plan. Uh, the market's fairly low with some exceptions, and the city centre or anywhere close to the four AVs are going to be really solid investment areas, in, in my opinion. There's some great opportunities there, you just have to know where to go and, um, and what, they, sort of what they are. Uh, we're educating people with our podcast with that. Uh, the city centre is going to be a, a pretty funky place, and if people have been down there recently and seen it, they'll know what I mean. It's going to be different to any other city in New Zealand. Yes, it might take another 10 years or so, uh, but the long-term population figures provided by the government a couple of weeks ago were encouraging, saying that immigration or the net flow into Christchurch was second to Auckland with over 100,000 people in the next 10 years. Um, so again, back to what I said earlier, I'm not a financial advisor to someone that loves uh, dealing with property every day. In the, in the so-called hot areas or small town New Zealand, I'd be buying under value at the moment. And if you're in Auckland, uh, if you have a good plan to handle whatever's thrown at you in the upcoming years, you can still pay market value for it. So there you go, I've, uh, I've taken a wee while to go through that stuff, but that's all good. Um, so next part of what I'm talking about is new builds, and, and why am I talking about new builds? Um, the main reason is, as soon as those LVR rules come in last year, I sat down with a few people and said, um, yeah, okay, how can investors carry on investing? And if you only need 20% for a new build, um, you still get 80% uh, lending, that obviously helps your situation moving forward to buy other property. So I'm just going to talk for a couple more, five minutes about new builds. And what I mean new builds, I'm talking about off the plan apartments, townhouses or homes, sections or sections with land and home packages. So, one of the advantages you can, for a 10% normally, you can uh, get your hands on a, a property that hasn't been built yet. Obviously if the growth's going well in that particular area, you're making money while well, you've only got thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 down towards that property. Uh, does this provide you options? Obviously if uh, you've made 10% while you're waiting, you only need another 10% to actually um, put in the property to, um, to buy it. Or if you've made 10% or more, you, you've got an option where you might want to trade the property. So you sell the property the day you buy the property and you get the difference. And yes, you will have to pay tax if you do that. Um, the other thing I really like about new builds if, is the uh, you still have depreciation on chattels. And I was talking to a chap today that just bought a new build with $36,000 of furniture in it. Um, that equates to chattels, which equates to uh, a lot of tax you can claim back the first year and a little bit less the second year and for about four years. Now if you use that money wisely and as I've got there come up less maintenance, obviously in a new build you should have no maintenance for the first few years. Now you can end up there with um, you know six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars extra the first year than you might normally have. Now, if you use that wisely and chuck towards the principal of a place, you're actually making the principal come down you owe on the on the debt. Um, which gives you flexibility, more money to invest somewhere else, um, and also better cash flow. So there's a couple of good options that you can do to make better cash flow and get you moving your portfolio through quicker. Hands off investment, obviously um, you don't have to do too much with it, you let everyone else uh, look after the property, and the loan to value ratios, as we said, 20% is pretty good. Okay, um, I was going to show you a quick, quick example of what I mean. We've got these places at the moment in Cambridge, they start at 585,000, rents 450, doesn't look that flash when you look at it as that. The difference between a new build and existing property that I've got up there, you're only paying 117,000 to buy that property rather than 234, a standalone three bedroom places. And, it's, and as we talked about, if you use depreciation and maintenance wisely, you've now got seven to 10,000 extra the first year, a bit less the second, third and fourth year that you can put against the principal. If you do that, you're going to have uh, less mortgage, and uh, the rent then becomes more than it actually is, even if it stays the same. Um, and you know, looking at the, what the deposit you pay for existing property, you're a far better off situation. And then if you get um, uh, other places like that with good cash flow, uh, like one that we're getting in Queenstown soon, four bedroom, four bathroom, they're about a seven and a half percent net yield or gross yield then you have a cash cow and then you apply those same principles to the new build by paying off the principal and put you in a solid position moving forward. So I think they're a, um, a good, good part and you'll see some more stuff come out from Property Ventures about new build shortly. Okay, and I'm just going to uh, 
Oh, sorry, right. we've uh, got one more slide here with new builds. Just the things to be aware of, and you know, obviously the, when you buy the market turning, you have to be careful that where the market is, or you are you are a pretty happy, um, you know, when when you're buying in a particular area. A lot of that comes down to the developer's experience. Yeah, you know, just run through the development experience. That's the most crucial part of buying an investment uh, and off the plans building how good they are. And a, a developer is no different than a small time reno, sell and hold investor. We get wiser the more we do, and and things like them. You know, they get them to find out what the needs of the buyers are, the tenants' needs, community needs, construction costs, lending criteria, and timelines of the project. So the more experienced they are, the more likely the project is going good for for them, and, and that means good for you. One of the things you must have, which is a uh, one of the things experienced developer will do, is a sunset clause. And I got called out once for this when I was very experienced years ago. Um, if you if you are near the top of the market like we are, and if a developer says it should be finished in December this year, and it's not finished for a year later, and the market turns and you start losing money, unless it's got a thing called a sunset clause, you might have to buy a property that's that's worth less than you've actually paid for it. So what they do, you put a sunset clause in, and it might be three months after the developer says it's finished. And at that point, you can either, uh, if it's not built by then, you can pull out of the deal and get your deposit back, or you can um, carry on if it's uh, still, if you've made a lot of money in the meantime. And the last thing is financing. Again, it's more of a Chris thing, but uh, the days of um, getting lending for, held for you for more than a year is very, um, they've gone pretty well. Okay, I'm just going to spend about two minutes finishing off uh, on tips on selling your property in the market and why it's quite crucial now. Um, you know, there are still a lot of buyers right now in the market. Some people, agencies have been saying there aren't, there are, and I think they're realising that. The difference is they don't want to pay too much prop, uh, money for a property right now. So the most important thing you don't want to do, you know, I tell people when I'm trying to sell, uh, get them to list with us, the job of a real estate salesperson to get the most eligible people to look at your property. And then by default, you'll get the best price. If you overprice a property right now, you're not getting everyone involved that might be interested in your property. So price your properties well. There's a lot of buyers still. Even if you under, under um, price it, you'll get people there. And then by you know, multi-offer, you'll, you'll get your good price anyway. Uh, finance is hard to get obviously for options. I know one bank I heard the other day aren't actually lending at options at the moment. And it pays to be working with an educated agent right now. He understands the market, needs of the buyer and the seller, and they can negotiate a good deal for you. And the last thing is um, don't be afraid, especially in maybe another six months, do something different if necessary. Don't be scared to throw your portion as part of the deal, or um, maybe not quite that extravagant. Um, uh, but you know, in another year or two, when it's getting hard to sell, make it more attractive and put something else in the deal. People like that. So um, that's all I've got to cover in my uh, short 20 odd minutes tonight. Uh, to get hold of us, um, you know, we uh, we we deal in Auckland, Waikato, Bay, Clinty, Wellington, Christchurch, and other areas. We sell um, and new builds in different areas. On top of that, go and have a look at us, PropertyVentures.co.nz. Um, and you can uh, come and ask us any questions through that site. Take a listen to the podcast if you want. Matthew Gilligan, in fact, all the, I think the three main people, GO Ray, have all been as guests on this podcast. Uh, we give free education, up to, up to date and, uh, information from uh, pretty educated people around the country. So have a listen to that. And um, I'll leave that to hand over to Chris. And again, thanks for listening all, and hope you find the night entertain and feel free to send any questions through if you don't ask them later on. Thank you Mark. I will try and uh, get through a bit of a finance summary as quickly as possible to because I'm sure both uh, John and Mark want to get back on to answer, answer some of your questions, we're already missing you. Um, a quick summary on, on myself. Uh, we're a bit different to a lot of brokers. We've got access to all the main banks. You'll find a lot don't. Uh, we're one of the largest mortgage advisory firms in the country. Uh, I personally specialise in the property investment space, but we've got uh, specialists in other areas, including risk insurance cover as well. I want to start off with a, a bit of a, a market overview from a finance point of view. Um, unless you've been living under a rock, uh, in, in the Auckland area in particular, you'll be aware that there's been a, a slowdown, especially over the last six months. And this has been caused by a number of factors, you know, higher mortgage rates, 
the uh, LVR restrictions, the banks themselves tightening up credit, and the banks finding it harder to actually fund uh, debt growth moving forward. And I suppose looking at uh, each of those individually in a little bit more depth, looking at interest rates, we've got quite acclimatised to, to a low credit environment. This isn't something uh, that applies just to New Zealand. Uh, it's become common around the world. And with, with low credit rates, we've actually seen um, in some ways asset bubbles. When you have to pay less for things, it does tend to push up the asset uh, prices. Now, we're starting to move into a bit of a different environment. And you can see from the, the chart on the screen over the last few months, interest rates have definitely been nudging up. Uh, in regards to things that affect uh, interest rates, the official cash rate, which has tended to affect floating rates and short-term fixed rates, has actually been reduced three times since December 15. But the floating rates have actually been nudged up as the banks try to grab more margin. At the other end of the fixed rate curve, we've seen uh, countries like the US in particular um, have been raising their rates. And so, in my opinion, we've definitely hit the, the bottom of the interest rate cycle. Um, it's debatable about how far things will move up, but it's definitely a time to, to be a little bit careful when there'll be some, some blood on the floor, I think, in the next few years by people who have got acclimatised to very low interest rates, particularly in the low forts. Um, ANZ have done some quite good analysis on this in the Auckland region, looking at the average household uh, buying the, the average house. And it's looking like it's about 51% now of household income would need to go to support a mortgage. Now, to give you an idea, if interest rates were to nudge up a percent, that would effectively put that up to 56%. If you take this out to the wider economy, that obviously means less spending on lattes, dinners, uh, you know, etc. That then has a flow on to, to businesses and, and jobs and employment. So th this is a bit of a factor. Um, for those of you who haven't overstretched yourself, it should mean that some good bargains. For those of you who have maybe pushed a little bit too far, maybe consider either offloading uh, some things or maybe even look at locking down interest rates to give yourself some certainty. Now, in regards to the LVR restrictions, um, previously we saw uh, the first couple of restrictions come in in 13 and 15, and the Chinese probably profit a lot from it, because while other people were getting locked out, they tend to have access to a lot of equity, and they tend to go on a bit of a shopping spree. They are still getting money out of China, but they're definitely not finding it as easy as they were. So that's definitely meant that the, the market has slowed in that part. Uh, FOMO, I stole this from Tony Alexander, a fear of missing out, that that effect seems to be dissipating. We've seen a lot over the last few years, um, people tend to go to auctions when we have very high auction clearance rates, and you get the emotional people paying well above the odds because they'd already been to a number of auctions and missed out. We're now having the opposite, the opposite effect where clearance rates are tending to be very low, Saw one of the, the main Auckland brands, um, West Auction clearance rates hit 12% I think a couple of weeks ago. And so now people are realising that it's maybe a bit more of a buyer's market. They can play the game for a little bit longer and have a better chance of picking up a good deal. Something which uh, has been a little bit of a surprise and with the restrictions coming in is when they were first announced, it looked like that would open up a lot of opportunities for the non-bank market because they're not regulated as such by the Reserve Bank. So that looked like, for example, with the 40% deposit restriction, that they could jump in there, provide 70, 80% funding, and fill a lot, of, a lot of that gap. And they definitely came out and marketed that uh, originally, and um, were quite useful for a month or two there, but that's definitely pulled back. And so I'm mainly concentrating on what I'll call the prime non-bank market, so the, the lenders which price reasonably close to the banks. And so uh, the main, I suppose lenders there would be Resimac, who are still marketing that they're lending to 80% on investment, but they will only do so if they also grab your own occupied property, which uh, I don't recommend. And if you talk to Gillick and Rowe from in regards to their split banking, they don't recommend that from an asset structure and point of view either. Liberty is still doing a 70% standalone investment product. So for those of you who maybe tapped that a little bit on uh, equity, they can get you above that 60% line. And for those of you who are maybe looking at some of the areas which Mark mentioned before, uh, so outside Auckland or Hamilton, there is a credit union who is looking uh, at, at some standalone 80% investment lending. It only lend up to people who have got uh, no more than three investment properties. They will not lend in Auckland or, or Hamilton, uh, but they will consider looking at, at 80%. So an option for some of, the, uh, of you who may find that deposits are a bit of an issue. 
uh, tighter credit criteria. And I think John alluded to this when he first started talking. And while um, we've seen the market tighten and a lot of the media is concentrated on especially the LVR restrictions, the banks themselves have really tightened up. Uh, you can see on this chart here I've got on the screen, on the, so towards the top end of the, of the chart is when credit's easier to get, on the lower end is when it gets harder. And you can probably see the, the previous time it dipped below the midpoint was in late 13 when the first LVR restrictions came in. Now you can see it kind of plummeting down at a rapid rate of knots and that's obviously a, a huge amount of people indicating that they're finding it hard to get their hands on, on credit at the moment. Uh, tighter, more, more information I suppose on tighter credit criteria. Uh, APRA, so this is the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority. Just the name makes them sound like, I suppose, a bunch of cardigan wearing fun police. Um, and, and they're a bit painful. So they've been regulating a lot in the Australian market in particular. So what they've done is look at things like interest only. Uh, they're limiting over there to no more than 30% of total lending can be interest only loans moving forward. Um, I do expect that to probably be looked at over here. There's not too much indication of that when talking to the bank so far, but we do tend to find that the, the Aussie uh, parents tend to tap on the shoulders over here eventually and then that come across. So, so keep an eye on that. Uh, development funding in a lot of ways has been turned off by the main banks. So I'm in particular talking about larger scale development. Uh, all of the banks have what they call property finance units and they're pretty much shut the business at the moment. They're not really wanting that out um, through the media, but if you talk to most of the bankers in the know, they'll sit there and uh, you know, advise that they may fund existing clients. They're not really look at, looking at putting out uh, too much funding for new developments at the moment, which is obviously going to restrict uh, supply moving forward. Because a lot of developers have had to, to turn to the non-bank market because they can't get the cash out of the banks, that's meaning a lot of the finance companies are now low on funds because they've been swamped with uh, demand. So they're starting to, to run out as well. We've definitely noticed um, that revolving credit facilities have also become harder to get. Something that we've done from a standard asset stru um, structuring you know, process is try and get investors, traders, uh, business owners set up with, with revolving credit facilities so that you don't have to be running to the bank every time you need cash. You've got it sitting there without you necessarily having to pay for it. We're finding it harder and harder to, to get these out of banks. The banks have a bit of a funding dilemma. So the, the darker uh, blue line on the graph there is household borrowing. The lighter blue line is uh, retail deposits or people putting cash in the bank. And you can kind of see over uh, back in, you know, prior to the, G, the GFC, so say 2006, 2007, uh, household borrowing was outstripping deposits uh, at that stage. That wasn't as big a deal because the regulations back then meant that the banks were allowed to get a lot more cash through the wholesale funding markets. Now what you found um, lately is that we're in the same situation, but regulations have been put in which require the banks to source most of the, or a lot more of the deposits locally. And with having very low interest rates, they're struggling to do so. And so the, the, the amount of credit growth or credit demand is still far out, I suppose, stripping the amount of deposits that are going into the bank. And that's obviously causing an issue with the banks from a funding point of view, meaning that they are, are having to, to tighten their belt in regards to uh, their willingness to lend. The positives, um, ANZ and BNZ have actually come back into the market. I think John quickly mentioned that on his intro as well. These are the two banks I would probably sit there and say tend to swing the most. When the going is good, they'll tend to throw cash out, price very well, but we have to be a bit wary as they're probably more likely to treat their customers reasonably harshly, uh, especially in a downturn. So ANZ in particular, we found we're out of the market in a lot of ways for a lot of last year. Uh, BNZ tended to pull back probably about the third quarter of last year, and because both have, have lost a bit of market share, they've now kind of come back in. They definitely don't have the same uh, appetite to, to lend as they maybe did you know, 18 months ago, but they have actually come back in, and in some cases, especially in ANZ's case, they're actually pricing very aggressively. Be aware on the flip side of that, though, that they will at some stage go the other way. Local banks, so lenders like TSB uh, and SBS, we're finding really useful at the moment. They don't have the, the same restrictions imposed on them as, as some of the big Aussie banks who have these Australian parents. Um, so we're finding that they will 
tend to, to do some loans and tend to be easier to deal with in some cases than the, the Australian loan banks. A lot of the Aussie banks are you're dealing with ivory towers um, and you know bureaucracies where some of the, the lenders like SBS and TSB in particular, they're a bit of a little bit like um, how old school banking used to be. Uh, the Chinese banks are likely to have an impact over time. They've really only got a small footprint so far. But uh, hopefully over time, just as the, the sheer size of them, are likely to keep some of the other banks here more honest and maybe improve some pricing. And maybe a little bit longer into the future, we are likely to see a larger, stronger non-bank market emerge. There was something I was reading in regards to the Reserve Bank yesterday that they're expecting to maybe uh, look at licensing a lot of four peer-to-peer -peer lenders over the next few months, all of them, I think, who are looking to maybe enter the mortgage market one way or another. So again, these lenders would not have to abide by our Reserve Bank LVR restrictions or any other controls. So there may be some, some uh, opportunities that will arise with, with more entrance into the market. It's definitely much easier to, to purchase well at the moment. I think after having a couple of years of, as I mentioned earlier, very um, high clearance rates at auctions, uh, you know, the papers like the New Zealand Herald on a daily basis talking about the property market, which means that, that, that you know every man and sundry was basically attending auctions. We're now going through a little bit of the opposite, where there's a bit of doom and gloom, which from an investing point of view is fantastic. It means that there, there's more opportunities around, which also makes it a lot easier, I think, for first-home buyers to get into the market. It's, it's hard, especially for a first-home buyer, to go along to an auction in quite an aggressive uh, sales situation and get in there. It's a lot easier to maybe go along and, and a buy negotiation uh, situation, get something under contract. So definitely for, for those of you who are just looking to enter the market or have got kids who are trying to get in, good time to maybe start looking as long as you're purchasing well. Not great from a social point of view, but with uh, my investors hat in on the housing shortage is only going to get worse. Um, we're just not going to build enough houses for, for a long time, especially with the banks not wanting to, to put that much cash out there on the um, development side. So. While I don't think Auckland house prices are going to go rocketing up anytime shortly, similar to what Mark said, I think there's a floor which is probably going to get put under how far they can maybe go down as well, simply by the lack of supply. Also compare probably where we are now to maybe prior to the GFC. And the restrictions which have been put on the banks mean that they're in a much better position. At this stage last cycle, I was doing 112% mortgages. Um, we were doing mortgages for basically people who didn't have to prove any any income at all, right up to 95% lending. Um, you know, pretty much if you had a pulse, I could get you money. At this stage here, obviously, with the restrictions that are put on, it's painful, I suppose, for those of us who would like to be out there investing a whole lot more, but it does mean that the banks are in a much safer position, which should uh, shelter us from, from too much of a downturn. Recommendations. Um, while I've mentioned it's a lot harder to get revolving credit facilities, I would still be recommending for those of you who have got untapped equity to try and get them in place. Um, it's not going to hurt to, to, to give it a go. Some banks are still putting them out. You may not be able to get as large a facility as what you used to be able to, but um, if you can get something, it's, it's worthwhile having some spare capital sitting there. Again, um, top up rentals if you've got some equity in there under the 60% line, and maybe if you've got some debt on your own occupied property, uh, pay that down. Um, it's also a time, especially maybe on rental properties, if you've got deferred maintenance and maybe get in there and access some cash, clean that up. You don't want to be going into a market where it's harder and harder to get credit um, with work that's required on your properties. Something that we've been doing a lot of is what we call break fee analysis. Uh, going back to one of the first things I said with interest rates maybe looking like they're going to uh, increase is doing a break fee situation where you see how much it may cost you to break your existing rates and then doing some analysis on whether you would better to lock them in for a longer period now. So a lot of you might have rates coming off in 3, 6, 9, 12, 12 months, and it may only be a minimal amount to break out now and maybe lock for, say, 3 or 4 years to give yourself a lot more certainty. Uh, potentially, if cash flow is, is of importance, look at maybe <coughs> locking in interest-only terms now before there are any restrictions put in. As I mentioned earlier, we haven't had any of the banks indicate that they're going to put them in, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised to see it. So if cash flow, cash flow is important, maybe look at getting that done shorter rather than later. Uh, if anyone would like a, a finance strategy discussion uh, in regards to where you're at, uh, anything we can do, feel free to, to uh, get in contact with us at that website. 
Now I think we're going to get on to question time. So I've got John and Mark uh, coming around, and we will get on to questions. Thanks, Chris. Now you're going to have to deal with. Okay, we'll just work through um, everybody's questions and that thing. But one of the things I'd like to sort of um, throw sort of to either of these two gentlemen um, in inverted commas. Um, is around the whole cycle of the property market. I recall statistics and that sort of thing going back and um, on various ups and downs and, and that's the nature of markets. And if you look back historically, you know, the, the biggest down in the New Zealand market was um, I think in the 1970s when uh, the population of Christchurch effectively exited. Uh, and of course, who would like to go back and buy property back then? But one of the interesting things that I've found um, going through some stats quite a wee while ago was uh, during the GFC is to um, the, the town that actually went up in value um, for 18 months probably because they, um, and I hope I'm not offending anyone from that town, um, and that it was invocable still after um, you know the market had seized up a bit. Uh, they kept going up for 18 months and I think um, maybe Nobody had um, told them that there was the, one of the largest financial um, crashes since the GFC. Uh, so, first question I'd like to get on to um, here is um, in regards to use of money interest. Just let me go through that. Um, uh, so, um, oh, somebody commented that they. Um, appreciate the change for use of money interest and that they were making submissions on it themselves. Uh, it has been those changes to use of money interest around provisional tax is one of the big areas that I've seen extremely un um, unfair outcomes for people for years. Um, now, in regards to um, is interest, um, if interest is only paid on the May provisional tax now, does that mean it isn't necessary to pay any tax on the first two dates? No, that is wrong. Um, you're still required to pay provisional tax. Um, if you don't pay them, then you will be hit with late, late payment penalties. It's a situation where you don't pay enough tax to meet your um, ultimate tax liability. Um, that's when historically and then revenue have charged uh, use of money interest. Uh, so there are two penalties that you can have imposed on short paid provisional tax and that is both interest and or penalties. Uh, sadly you can't um, avoid paying the first two payments um, and lump it all in one. That would be great for cash flow uh, but you will be hit with short payment penalties. Uh, let me just go through and see if anything else is down there. Um, yeah. If you have three cars, one is a business, uh, solely a business car, and you have no employees in a trust, and a trust owns the car, and 100% expenses can be claimed. Uh, trusts are a little bit um, unusual, and the changes applied to companies uh, with less than five individual shareholders. There are other rules that apply to trusts, and I'd suggest that if you have a trust, um, a trading trust that you are providing and benefits to, uh, if you're a GRA client, get in touch with your client services manager and go through those because um, it is quite a complex area. There are different rules for different entities. Hey, um, just running through. Um, is negative gearing and other tax incentives around property likely to be removed after the elections in response to too much investor activity? Um, Chris, any comment on that? Before I throw my two cents in, I would say, yeah, sorry, um, I'd say unlikely. I mean, we've got to be a bit careful about who we let in. I'm a bit worried about the Mana Party going in near us again, and Winston would try and turn uh, immigration off and all that type of stuff. But you're you're much better placed to, uh, to answer that. Um, my, look, I'll, I'll throw the, um, the the comment out there. That there's nothing better for accountants and lawyers than a Labour government. Um, if rules come in around capital gains tax and that sort of thing, um, then that will be uh, a, a great time for the accountants and lawyers out there. We are always much busier uh, during a Labour government um, than we are during anything else. 
the more um, radical the government, the better it is um, for us. In regards to your question, negative gearing and other tax incentives, look, one of the fine balancing acts that the government or any government has to do is around ensuring that there is a sufficient housing supply to meet demand and also that there, um, particularly around rental and other things. There's also, of course, the overwhelming, um, uh, overriding thing that majority of small businesses who are the bigger, as a sector, the biggest employer in New Zealand are funded by security over the homes. So um, while most governments try and at the moment uh, are talking down property and there have been some tweaks around it and that thing and certainly uh, the opposition has been beating things up, to some extent I think that it's unlikely that they, anyone's going to do too much to stab um, the property market because they need investors to supply housing stock to um, people that can't afford to buy the properties um, and, and you know that need the rentals. So there's that whole thing out there and they don't want to destroy cash flow of small businesses. So I think it's unlikely that negative gearing um, will be removed. Um, it's, it may be that uh, I see Labour is still uh, saying that while they're not um, actively pushing a capital gains tax for this election, they are undertaking to do a review of the tax system and if capital gains tax is um, found to be um, appropriate by that review then uh, they will consider bringing it in then. So you know, to some extent you've got to look very very closely at people's policies. I think um, even jumping in is, is some of the stuff we've seen over the last 12 months with things like Osaki and there's, that, that's putting pressure back on being a landlord. They have to be very careful as John has said to turn off property investment otherwise we just won't have the supply. Yeah. Another question, people are talking about a crash in Auckland, is this really happening as the market is slowing down? Um, looking at the stats, I, I was actually preparing some evidence for a, um, on behalf of a valuation of a construction business and um, to some extent there is a lot of statistics around that the current slowdown is finance driven. It's a bank driven, it's a funding driven slowdown. The LVR rates, the 40% LVR rates have, have very much kicked in and hit the average investor. Those big investors who are, um, aren't dependent upon bank borrowing haven't been impacted as much. So I think that yes, while the market has slowed down, that is a reflection of people's ability to get money. We still aren't seeing supply outdoing demand. So, um, you know, the fundamentals are all there. It's just that the cash is tight to get there. I think if I can jump in for one second, but one comment to make there will be to see over time if we move from a LVR restriction to maybe more of a, a debt to income restriction. I think where the Reserve Bank has maybe gone the wrong way, people don't go broke on lack of equity, they go broke when their cash flow screws up. And one of the big issues that John and I were talking about probably before this is the, is the really big detrimental effect on small business where in New Zealand we don't have, the banks don't tend to be very good at lending on cash flow businesses. We, we lend off the back of people's houses and there'll be a flow on effect down the track if people can't, uh, you know, access borrowing. Okay, somebody has said here, um, Chris, over to you finance and LVR rates on um, new builds. Okay, so when doing a one into three new build development, is the LVR 80% on the initial purchase or 60%? So I'm making the assumption here that the initial purchase is a rental rather than a uh, owner occupied. So the, that means the initial purchase is gonna be um, 60%. Uh, so you're gonna need a 40% deposit. So where there is a large capital requirement is you're going to need a 40%, uh, you're then going to need to put the funds in to subdivide. Once you've got the new titles, you can then leverage those to 80% as, as well as the build on the new titles. Uh, potentially if you move into it as an owner occupied, then you may be able to get 80% the whole way across. Okay. Um, somebody else here has asked, if I finance part of the investment property through a loan on my house that I live in, the property will be owned by an LTC, am I able to claim interest on that loan? If you are buying a property to rent it out, even if you're cross securing it against your home, then 
all the borrowings that you have incurred to buy that property are generally tax deductible. Again, um, if, if you're embarking, if you're a new investor, really, really important, I stress that you get um, your structures right. Uh, depends, and you know, an LTC may not necessarily be the appropriate vehicle for you. Get some advice. If you're um, a GRA client, come in and see us. If you're not, uh, if you've never been a client, uh, register for a free interview on our website and um, we'll run through and have a look at your particular circumstances. Um, I'm just really aware of the timing and that's thing, so maybe we'll look at one more question and uh, we'll um, go from there and then what we'll do is that we'll send a recording of this around um, for everybody afterwards. So here we go. Um, what are some of the factors that should be considered before deciding on an investment property ownership structure? Uh, look, everybody's situation is different. Uh, if you're self-employed, if you are in a blended family, if you uh, um, have a non-income earning or a lower income earning spouse, uh, if, you are, um, if you have a relationship property agreement in place, uh, there are so many different factors that need to be taken into account. And you need to look at things quite holistically. So you need to not only look at tax, but things like asset protection, estate planning, uh, relationship property, the accounting issues and all of those sort of things, and, and to get the right answer. Um, so look, again, um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, GRA have another few events um, coming up in the near future. We've got a economic update with Matthew Gilligan and uh, Tony Alexander from the BNZ. It's very, very popular. It said 900 odd people last year. You can register for that on our website. Also, um, we've got our regular uh, property investment evenings. Uh, if you're new to property or you want to learn more about it, come along to one of those. Um, and uh, get, get a bit of education and go from that. I'd like to close and um, thank uh, Chris Peterson, Peterson, sorry, from um, Chris Peterson Mortgages for his time. Also, um, Mark from Property Ventures, um, two great guys, uh, two good businesses that have been very, very helpful to our clients. So I want to thank them for coming along and joining us tonight and everybody for uh, logging in and listening. So thank you all very much. Have a good evening and uh, be safe, stay safe in this weather. Thank you, everyone.